general route you'd like to take to see the best sites and where to leave your car to pick up a week later. But it would be pretty useless when you're standing in the forest trying to decide which tiny creek to follow to get up to that little lake you wanted to visit. For intricate navigational decisions, you're far better off with the 1 to 24,000 map. But if you're canoeing for a week down a fast flowing river, you'll be covering a lot of distance quickly. And if you've chosen 1 to 24,000 maps, you're going to need a huge stack of maps to cover your trip. You might be better off in that case with a 1 to 62,500 scale map. One inch on these maps equals one mile in the real world. That's probably enough detail for you to keep track of where you are, but not so much detail that you'll need a separate backpack to carry all your maps. Maps come in any number of scales. The important thing to remember is to check the scale and select a map with a scale that will be appropriate for how you want to use it. The map key will also tell you the date the map was last updated. The USGS, or United States Geological Survey, stopped updating its topo maps in the 1990s. And in stores, you can still find maps that were last updated in the 50s. If you're using the map only to see landforms, an old map is probably still just fine. But if you're using it to see human-made features, it's probably way out of date. I once changed my plans at the last minute for a canoe trip in Maine and needed to find maps for an area where I wasn't originally planning to go. The only maps I could find on short notice were last updated in the 1950s. Most of the lakes and rivers were the same, but on Third Lake Machias, I kept getting confused. Every time I thought I was approaching an island, it would turn out to be a peninsula. I finally figured out that the dam that had been there in the 1950s had since been removed. The lake level was now significantly lower than when my map had been made. All those former islands were now reconnected with the mainland. Companies that make recreational maps update their maps regularly, but it's still a good idea to check the date. If you're going to be using GPS waypoints or latitude and longitude coordinates from a guidebook, it's also important to check the map's datum to see if it's the same datum used by your GPS or guidebook. The datum is the underlying mathematical model of the shape of the Earth that a map uses to determine coordinates of any given place. Many recreational maps, even recently published maps, use the North American datum of 1927, which is often abbreviated as NAD27. Back then, surveyors calculated the coordinates of any given place based on how far it was from Meads Ranch, Kansas. But almost all GPS units, by default, use a different datum, the World Geodetic System from 1984, which is often abbreviated as WGS84. It calculates the coordinates of any given place based on how far it is from the center of the Earth. So depending on how far you are from Meads Ranch, Kansas, your GPS coordinates might agree with your map, or they might be significantly different. Luckily, you can change the settings on your GPS so that it uses the same datum as your map. Next, check the contour interval. This is the difference in elevation between one contour line and the next. In areas that are very flat, it may be as little as five feet. And in areas that are very steep, it could be as many as 40 feet. If you're used to reading a map with small contour intervals and you switch to a map with a large contour interval, you may not realize just how steep the terrain is. For example, look at this land feature. It doesn't look too steep along the ridge, does it? The only places it looks steep are the obvious cliffs on either side. But this is Half Dome in Yosemite. This ridge is in fact very steep. We were fooled because we were used to looking at the 20-foot contours on the map of Katahdin. These are 40-foot contours. Next, check the map's north arrow. Most maps have true north at the top, but not always, so it's good to check. This map from the Northern Forest Canoe Trail is oriented to get the most distance of the water route onto the page, so north is slightly off to one side. Some maps are oriented to grid north instead of true north. 
If your map is oriented to grid north, on the north arrow, it'll likely show the difference between true north and grid north. These are just two different ways of projecting the round surface of the Earth onto the flat map. In most places, the angle between the two is no more than a degree or two. For all practical purposes while backpacking, you can ignore the difference between grid north and true north. Our compasses aren't precise enough to have that one degree make a difference. The final thing to check on your map is the magnetic declination for the area. But I'm going to wait to tell you about that until after we talk about how to actually use the map and compass to navigate in the field. Your map will be the most helpful to you if you always have it out while you're traveling and you consistently track your course on it. It's not like mapping software on a phone or GPS that'll show you a you are here dot. If you put your map in your pack and hike for an hour and then pull it back out and try to figure out where you are, it's potentially going to be tough. I once took a navigation workshop from a navigation expert in the Australian military. His mantra was, if you always know where you are, you'll never be lost. That observation may, at first, seem obvious to the point of being useless, but it is really the key to navigation. Have your map out, either in your hand or in a map case that hangs around your neck or straps to the canoe bag in front of you, where you can constantly look at it. Ask yourself, as you travel, what you expect to see, and then confirm that you see it. For example, if you were hiking northbound on the Appalachian Trail in Vermont and had just summited Glastonbury Mountain, you'd soon come to a point where two trails that had been paralleling each other diverge. If you accidentally took the wrong one and you have your map out and are following along as you walk, you should catch your mistake. You would have been expecting to have had the trail veer slightly to the left after descending from the summit. But this trail veered more sharply toward the right. And then you would have expected to cross another trail at this four-way intersection. But instead, you had a trail T intersect you from the left. You would have expected to have had a ridge slightly to your left side as you were descending. But instead, you're on top of a subtle ridge with slight depressions on either side. If you stop at this point, study the map, and compare what you have seen with what you expected to see, you will likely figure out your error and be able to retrace your steps to the place where the two trails diverged and get back onto the AT. In contrast, if you had looked at the map only while you were on the top of Glastonbury Mountain, and then tucked the map away into the lid of your pack, figuring you'd take it out again when you reached the next peak, you might have followed the wrong trail for quite some distance. Perhaps you would have walked all the way to this first Y-shaped intersection before thinking, huh, I wonder where I am, and then pulling out your map. But because you are still thinking that you are on the AT, and you don't remember any specifics of the forest you've just hiked through, other than a vague recollection that you've been going downhill, you'll probably assume that you are at this Y-shaped intersection. Trails on both sides of the Y continue downhill, so it will seem correct to you. So you'll take a left fork, but now, instead of continuing down the AT, you're just getting further off track on this unmarked spur trail. While it is possible to navigate well with only a topographic map, Adding in a compass will make it easier. The most basic way to use a compass with a map is to use the compass to help you orient the map to the real world. In a place with no magnetic declination, and with a map where true north is at the top of the map, this is as simple as placing the side of the compass along the side of the map. Make sure both the direction of travel arrow and the orienting arrow are pointing at north. Then, rotate the map with a compass sitting on it until the red magnetic needle spins into the center of the orienting arrow. Now that your map is oriented to the real world, the land features you see when you look out from the top of Glastonbury Mountain 
should be in the same positions relative to you as they are on the map. For example, if you were looking west while holding the map, you'd have the top of the map in your right hand and the bottom of the map in your left hand. And as your eyes moved over the map from Glastonbury Peak west towards Trimble Mountain and then lifted off the map to the real world, you'd see the actual Trimble Mountain in the distance, just on the other side of Highway 7. As you hike, you can keep your map oriented by folding it to a manageable size and holding your compass and map in the same hand. Keep the side of the compass lined up with the side of the map. Keep the direction of travel arrow pointing to the north on the map, and then just rotate the entire package, map and compass, as you walk to keep the red magnetic needle inside the orienting arrow. When you have your map and compass in your hand the entire time you're hiking, and you work on keeping the map oriented to the real world as you walk, you'll have many pieces to add to the navigation puzzle. In addition to paying attention to the landforms around you, you'll know which cardinal directions you've been walking. On a trail with various turns, this can help you pinpoint your location. For example, as the AT contours around the north side of this unnamed mountain, north of Mount Glastonbury, the trail stays down in the trees and at about the same elevation. Without a compass to help keep your map oriented, you'd be hard pressed to know exactly where you are. For this entire distance, the slope would be uphill to your right and downhill to your left. So being able to read the contour lines wouldn't be enough to tell you where you are. But the trail runs first northeasterly, then southeasterly, then almost due east before turning back again to the northeast and eventually to the north. If you've been following along with an oriented map, you'll know exactly where you are. This same technique would help you keep track of your location on a meandering river. Now, to tackle the concept of magnetic declination. Declination may seem like an intimidating concept to grasp, and you might feel tempted to just ignore it. But unless you're planning to recreate only in places where declination is zero, for example, along the line running from the tip of Louisiana up through Minnesota, Ignoring declination can get you quite lost. And rather than just memorizing a series of steps to adjust for it, I think it's better to understand how it works so you're less likely to forget how to adjust for it. So bear with me. The Earth has two North Poles, the geographic North Pole and the magnetic North Pole. Our maps are generally oriented to the geographic North Pole or true north. This is the point from which lines of longitude emanate. But our compasses point to the magnetic north pole, which migrates from year to year, but is generally in the Canadian Arctic north of Hudson Bay. Declination is the angle between true north and where your compass needle points. Looking at this chart of declination in the United States, you can see that as you move east from the zero declination line, your compass needle starts to point further and further west from true north. By the time you get over to New Hampshire, your compass needle will be pointing 15 degrees west of true north. If you follow your compass needle, thinking you're walking north, after only one mile of walking, you would be a quarter mile west of where you thought you were going to end up. As you move west of the zero declination line, your compass needle starts to point east of true north. So we get west declination in the eastern part of the United States and east declination in the western part. A good map should tell you the magnetic declination for your area as well as what year it was calculated. If the declination is more than a couple of years old, you should look up the current declination. Depending on where you are, declination can change significantly over time. For example, in 2019, the declination at Mount Katahdin is 16 degrees west. 
but it was 18 degrees west in 1999 and 20 degrees west in 1945. If you're using a declination figure from 1945, you could be four degrees off. That is enough to make a difference. To compensate for declination when you're orienting your map, rotate the bezel until the orienting arrow is at the correct declination, or angle, relative to true north. If you're on the west coast and have east declination, you'll move the orienting arrow towards the east on the compass bezel. This has the effect of subtracting degrees from your bearing. Some people like the mnemonic device, declination east, compass least, to remember that they subtract the declination. If you're on the east coast and have west declination, you'll move the orienting arrow towards the west on the compass bezel. This has the effect of adding degrees to your bearing. Some people like the mnemonic device, declination west, compass best, to remember that they add the declination, the idea being that adding is positive and so is best. To demonstrate, with my map of Katahdin, I'll start with the orienting arrow pointing directly towards the top of my compass, in line with the direction of the travel arrow. To compensate for 16 degrees west declination, I'll move the orienting arrow 16 degrees towards the west on the bezel, which adds 16 degrees to my original bearing of zero. Now, at the read bearing here marker, it says 16 degrees. I can now orient my map just as before by lining the edge of the compass up with the side of the map with the direction of travel arrow pointing towards true north. I then rotate the map and compass as one unit, just as before, until the red magnetic arrow snuggles into the orienting arrow. If all I'm doing with my compass is using it to keep my map oriented, I won't have to touch the bezel again for the remainder of the trip. And now you know everything you need to know to do basic on-trail or on-river navigation using a map and compass. It does take some practice, but the practice is fun. When you're first learning, pick places to practice where the trails are clearly marked and bring a GPS or a smartphone with a GPS app as a backup.